to the uh, Danbury Library, of course. Um, it's wonderful to be here in everyone's homes and living rooms through the magic of Zoom. Um, so thank you all for making time to be here. So um, I'm excited tonight to talk to you about the incredible masterwork of medieval uh, manuscript illumination that has been an inspiration not only to me, but to countless authors throughout history. As the narrator for our journey tonight, advance the slide here to get us all sort of in the mood. Um, as your narrator, I thought I'd start by explaining how it is that I came to this interest in the book of Kells. So I'm an art historian, but I'm not so much a medievalist as a revivalist, which means my interest in our golden age of visual culture begins largely at the turn of the 20th century and not too much in the ninth. The Gaelic revival has its roots in late Victorian interest in activities. It was a time when Ireland, the British Isles, and Europe took an interest in vernacular or Jewish culture as a means for its establishing and celebrating a unique national character and identity. In Ireland, this renewed interest in a pre conquest for a de-emphasized order, non-English uh, culture, included most prominently a revival of language, sports, art, literature, and even dress. Now, for me, it was the dress that really captured my imagination because, as an Irish American, I grew up Irish dancing. The costumes I wore were a holdover from this revival from the practice of wearing a Celtic costume, which included embroidery derived from, you may have guessed it, the Book of Kells. So from the age of seven, I had only a vague understanding of what this heritage meant, beyond that these Kells inspired animals and not work with symbols of Irishness. But as I hope to demonstrate to you this evening, the Book of Kells is not only a story of Ireland. It is, in its inspiration and execution, far more cosmopolitan than is often understood. Now, what I mean to suggest here by this term cosmopolitan is that the book, while uniquely Irish in many ways, is also a synthesis of a variety of influences which include Anglo-Saxon, late Roman antique, and even Byzantine resources. Scriptoriums, or dedicated spaces for manuscript production, at Lindisfarne, Iona, and Kells, may have been located at the edge of the medieval world, but they were not isolated, at least not in terms of their available resources. Columban monks traveled at least as far as Bobbio in what is now northern Italy through a vast network of monasteries. They exchanged manuscripts, talent, and materials, which filtered back to monasteries in Ireland. Now, before I kind of move forward, I have just a few caveats. So some of the challenges of understanding the Book of Kells lie naturally in its age and in the lack of documentation surrounding its creation. There is, of course, still so much that we don't know. And what we do know is changing all the time as we apply new methodologies and technologies to our understanding of the material culture of the past. For instance, in the decades since I was at Trinity College studying the Book of Kells, where the book now resides, Art historians and scientists have applied technology, a non-invasive infrared analysis, to discover precisely which pigments were used in the book. Further, a discovery in 2019 of the pigment ultramarine, which is uh, blue, like what you see on the screen here, uh, was found in the dental tartar of a female nun buried at a German monastery. And that's revising our understanding of who the members were because we normally think that they were male. But we're coming to understand um, that some of our illuminators may have been women. Now, this is enorm enormously significant. Um, and I would like to add that, of course, she was not eating the pigment. She was, in fact, using uh, her, her mouth and saliva in her mouth to um, sharpen the point on her brush. So she put her brush in the mouth, um, and that's how she got so much pigment in her teeth. Um, so suffice to say, um, some of what I'm going to be discussing here tonight is based on the current understanding, which in a few years' time or even less um, may have changed. And by this turn of the century desire, for Ireland to secure a distinctly Celtic past. That is, a history that would be neither European nor English in custom or character. 
Now, this has everything to do with timing, as the Gaelic League, uh, excuse me, the Gaelic revival in Ireland coincided with a push for political independence, which saw its strongest expression in the 1916 Easter Rising and the subsequent war for independence in 1919. Uh, ending in 1921. Not only do we have a dynamic and evolving understanding of Kells and its production, but we must consider this interpretation through the layers of myth that border on propaganda. Consequently, I'm going to begin our story here in the present, and we'll work our way back through the myths of time. Kells is the centerpiece of tourism at Trinity College in Dublin's bustling city center. As a student, I often had to fight a strong tide of tourists to get to classes, and I learned to avoid that main gate that you see there. Otherwise, I could be late to class. And this is because close to a million people travel to Ireland every year from all over the world to see the Pels in the old library. They come as a celebration of faith. They come out of curiosity. And of course, they come to tick the box on the way to the Guinness factory. But I like to think of them as trying to connect to their history, which of course, Kells is just one of many very salient symbols. Kells came to Dublin for safekeeping following the destruction of Cromwell's armies sometime after about 1653. Now, prior to that, the manuscript was believed to have been stolen around 1006. And according to the Annals of Ulster, it was recovered uh, shortly thereafter, hidden beneath some sod. Now, what these two episodes together suggest is an acknowledgement that Kells was, from its very inception, an acknowledged masterpiece that needed to be preserved and protected. And in fact, in the 12th century, we have one of our most famous quotes associated with Kells coming from Gerald of Wales, who said that Kells was, quote, the work of an angel and not of man, end quote. I think it is this reverence throughout time that draws us to Kells as much as its spectacular ornament in detail. When you look upon Kells, you're marveling at its ingenuity in much the same way that those of the past also experienced it. It's an object both of its time and yet it is timeless. In the revival, craftspersons such as those working in the Dun and guilds turn to Kells as source materials for prints and fiber arts. And the script of Kells, which is known as Insular Majuscule, was revived as a printing typeface, and it's now synonymous with Irishness. However, the Book of Kells, or accurately, the Kells manuscript, was not actually produced in Ireland, or at least it wasn't started there. We believe it began at Iona, which is a remote island located just off the west of Scotland. It's a monastery founded by St. Columba. Columba is also known as Columkill, and he lived there in the sixth century. And he's an Irish evangelist credited with spreading Christianity in Scotland. Along with Patrick and St. Bridget, he's one of three patron saints of Ireland. Now, by the early ninth century, the Vikings had begun their raids on these monastic outposts of the British Isles, and that is because monasteries were known for their spectacular metalwork produced in reliquaries, chalices, patents, and even book covers. In fact, it's impossible to really appreciate Kells without considering a complementary practice in Irish metalwork, as we're going to see. And I have here for you uh, details from two really key metalworks. Um, we have uh, the Arda Chalice and also the Tara Brooch. Um, and both of these are roughly contemporaneous with the production of Kells. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, there were at least two recorded raids on Iona in about 802 and 806, uh, during which um, these materials were stolen, monks were murdered, and this finally sent the community at Iona fleeing to Kells, which is how we suspect that the Book of Kells actually came to Kells Monastery itself. Now, notably, uh, the Book of Kells is technically an unfinished manuscript, which supports the theory that this book perhaps traveled to Kells under duress. And what you have on the left-hand side is an example of a page that is actually unfinished. You can see the, the type is there, but the ornament is just sort of half painted. Now it's unfinished state has proved enormously useful for studying production methods. It's helped scholars speculate, for example, that illuminators and scribes were actually different people, and we can examine how script and illustration was laid out and in what order. 
While the book is often associated with column kill, he was of course long dead by the time of its production. Though noted scholar Francoise Henri has suggested the book may have been commemorative of his death, but this is of course purely speculative. Now the Kells Monast Monastery is located in County Meath, which is just northwest of Dublin off of the M3, if you've ever driven there. Um, and it's in a reasonable proximity to the Hill of Tara. It was also a Columban monastery of traditional size and construction with a round ring wall and a round tower and a number of high crosses. And the tower is in fact um, all that's really left of that property now. Based on a limited number of manuscripts which survived from this period, we can guess that Ireland, Scotland, and Northumbria, which is um, located in the northern part of England, were part of a single unit, artistically speaking. Um, and that is why it matters less where Kells was made. Suffice, suffice, suffice it to say, uh, it emerged in what we would call a Christian Hiberno-Saxon tradition, which stretched across what we now recognize as Ireland and Great Britain. But that makes it no less special, special for those of us who are Irish. So what is Book of Kells? Kells is a late 8th or early 9th century illuminated gospel book, which contains four gospels in Latin based on the Vulgate text, which St. Jerome completed in 384. It is intermixed with readings from an earlier Old Latin translation. Kells contains 340 folios, now measuring about 10 by 12, and I say now because it has in fact been trimmed down from its original size and the edges uh, were gilded uh, by Victorians who were uh, well-meaning but um, did some unfortunate irrevocable damage to the book of Kells. Now we can't be sure for sure that these are the original pages because the current assemblage is actually missing a couple of key pages. For example, two of the evangelists portraits out of four are missing. And it's even been suggested that Paul's might be a synthesis of two or more gospel books. So again, we're somewhat cautious about what we have now as potentially deriving from a posthumous arrangement. In terms of its function, I'll be here. Um, there's a, we believe that it was a special ceremonial book um, and it was uh, special even in its own time. It was clearly meant to be seen and appreciated visually, and we can uh, surmise that it was probably used on high holy days, and that's because the illuminations are just so lavish. Um, but that's also because there are so many careless mistakes that are within the text. Um, we see a number of mistakes that are called high skips or places where words are repeated or phrases um, are completely omitted. Um, which suggests that the text is probably less important than the illustrations and the person using the text uh, probably knew the words um, and didn't need to rely on what was written there. And this is, uh, of course, the opposite of how we would normally think about these holy books where the text is really quite um, critical. But if you can, imagine the play of candlelight off of some of these um, incredible images um, because they would have been in a fairly dark chapel uh, the images would really have come to life with all of the colors and the imagery, which is why, of course, we call them illuminations. Now, before we progress to our study of what's in the pages, I'll speak a little more about the manuscript's production. Firstly, we aren't completely sure who was responsible for Kells, but based on formal analysis and comparison of the various illustrations, uh, we can suggest that there were probably three main uh, illuminators, which we've given um, nicknames based on their um, their prowess. So we have the, the illustrator, the portrait painter, and the goldsmith. And I have examples of their work for you um, here. The portrait painter was responsible for these stunning portraits of Christ, Matthew, and John. The illustrator painted impressive figures such as the four evangelists and the virgin and child. And the goldsmith was capable of such extraordinary fineness and delicacy that his skills have, of course, been likened to those of a goldsmith. And his most extraordinary illustration is the key row page that you see here. Now, the key and the row are, of course, the first two letters of uh, Christ's name in Greek. And we'll look more at that page in a little while. 
It suggested that illuminators were responsible for illustrations while scribes handled the copying of the text. And this is again based on our examination of unfinished pages where we can see that the script was completed first, leaving space for lavish illumination to follow. We've detected at least three and possibly four different hands in the script. Uh, and that is determined through a uh, close paleographic analysis of the handwriting in the Book of Kells. Now imagine for a moment how tedious this work would have been, particularly given the conditions of the time, which included a lack of electricity and heating for a start. I should remind you here that this is the only way books can be reproduced in the period. There's no printing press. If a scribe worked for about six hours a day copying a book by hand, it would take about two months to copy the text alone. And that says nothing of how long the illuminations would have taken. A carpet page like this one, which is called so because it resembles a Persian carpet, would take about two weeks to produce. So the time spent on these tedious and finely decorative works suggests that there was also possibly a meditative purpose to their generation in addition to their purpose as uh, instructional um, aids uh, within the text. But I've skipped over all the work, of course, that goes into assembling these manuscripts, which includes production of parchment of vellum from calfskins, making pigments, sewing, uh, binding, um, and so forth. So I have here just a very short video that we can watch that will sort of um, illustrate for you how um, many steps there are to actually producing the physical material itself. And Catherine, I'll rely on you here to tell me if the sound is not working. In the Middle Ages, parchment was used to make the pages of books. Parchment was made from the skins of animals. The transition from a fresh skin to a surface suitable for writing was a slow and laborious process. The parchment maker selected skins of sheep, goats, or calves. Skins were soaked in lime water for three to ten days to loosen the animal's hair. The parchment maker then scraped away the hair and any remaining flesh. After this, the skin was soaked in fresh water to remove the lime and then stretched tightly on a frame. A special rounded knife was used to scrape the hide to the desired thickness. The process of scraping continued over the course of several days. During this time, the parchment maker continually tightened the tension on the stretching frame while the skin dried. The result was parchment, a smooth and durable material that could last over a thousand years. Before parchment could be written on, it had to be specially prepared. First, the parchment was rubbed with pumice powder to roughen the surface, and then dusted with a sticky powder. These steps made the surface receptive to inks and colors. The whole finished skin was then cut down to the size of the pages needed for a particular book. A big manuscript was assembled from sheets almost as large as a single skin. For smaller books, the skin was cut into two or more pieces. The parchment sheets were folded and nested to make gatherings, usually of 16 or 20 pages. The vibrant illuminations in a medieval manuscript often overshadow the words on the page, yet the writing of the script was as important as the painting of the images. The tools of a scribe, the person who copied the text onto the page, were simple. Pens, called quills, were made from the feathers of a bird, which were soaked in water, dried, and hardened with heated sand. The scribe carved the quill to a rough point, cut a slit to draw ink down, then trimmed the point to the proper width. The shape of the quill point varied with the style of the lettering being copied. Scribes made ink from a variety of materials, gall nuts, growths found on oak trees, were often used to create a dark black ink. Black ink was also made by dissolving a common carbon substance. The resulting ink was called lamp black. Before the scribe began writing, he ruled the parchment using a straight edge. Medieval scribes and their patrons prized a regular and elegant script. If a scribe made an error, he would scratch it out with a penknife. 
Because the page was made from parchment, which was very resilient, it could stand many erasures of this type. An illuminator decorated the pages of a manuscript using paint and precious metals. He began only after a scribe had finished copying the text. The illuminator first sketched his design, then added details, such as the features of a figure or the interlacing of a decorated initial. Thin sheets of precious metals, like gold leaf, were always applied first. The illuminator put down a base coat consisting of either a plaster-like substance called gesso or a gum, as shown here. Once the gum base dried, the moisture in the illuminator's breath was enough to make the small piece of gold leaf stick to the page. Then the illuminator brushed away the excess and polished the gold leaf. After applying the gold leaf, the illuminator painted his design. Each color was made from a vegetable dye or a mineral substance ground up and dissolved in liquid. The illuminator applied the paler shades first, then the darker tones. Once the illuminator applied black outlines and delicate white highlights to the figures and vines, the illumination was finished. After the scribes and illuminators had finished writing and decorating the parchment pages, the manuscript was bound. Groups of folded sheets of parchment, called gatherings, were sewn together with strong linen thread onto flexible supports, such as these narrow leather thongs. Next, the binder attached end bands, which secured the top and bottom ends of the pages in the spine of the book. The binder then laced the leather thongs along the spine through channels and tunnels, which had been carved into wood boards. These boards were the covers of the manuscript. The thongs could be held in place by wood pegs or iron nails. The volume was then covered, usually with leather. Without pressure from the covers to keep the leaves flat, parchment expanded and contracted with changes in temperature and humidity. Pressure was applied by the addition of clasps or straps, which held the book closed. The binding of a manuscript could be decorated with any one of a variety of materials. A manuscript might be covered with leather, stamped or tooled with gold, or covered with silks or velvets. The most elaborate bindings received sculpted decoration made from precious metals. The materials of the binding depended on the wealth of the patron, the type of manuscript, and its intended use. As you can see from the video, uh, this was a laborious um, task. Um, it was very expensive um, and involved a lot of different people. And if you can imagine doing all of that uh, without the benefits of modern technology. Um, so I'll talk here a little bit more about um, what Kells is made of. And I do want to say that um, a bit different from what we saw in the video, Kells does not actually have any uh, gold in it. Um, and it also does not have a cover. It was likely uh, removed at some point. Um, and our, our uh, book is actually made from vellum instead of parchment vellum being um, made from calfskin. Um, so it's an even more precious um, support. So um, as I mentioned, we know exactly which pigments were used in Kells. They appear to have been locally sourced. Pigments include woad, which was an ancient dye um, that made the colors, the blue colors. Uh, gypsum, which formed the whites. Lichen, which is a kind of mold produced our pinks and our purples. Orpiment is yellow, and that is used to sort of replicate the experience of gold leaf in the manuscript. And then we also have a red lead and a copper green. Now, a number of these are actually quite difficult to work with. Copper green, for example, had a tendency to eat through a support surface. So some of our older books um, do actually have um, not shaped holes in them where the green used to be. Um, and orpiment, uh, for example, is actually quite poisonous, though we're not sure to what extent scriptoriums were actually aware of mineral toxicity, um, but it's safe to say throughout history many artists and craftspeople have actually um, slowly poisoned themselves with their materials. So by layering and mixing, illuminators were able to get a rather impressive range of colors and contrast. 
of note in the sourcing of these pigments um, was that these materials were sourced locally. So it gives us a sense of how self-sufficient a scriptorium in Ireland would have been. Now, aside from the resource texts that they were copying from, which came uh, probably from the European mainland, um, we can say that a lot of what they used actually came um, from right within their area. We had originally thought that perhaps they'd been using lapis lazuli, um, but of course the technology tells us that, that is not true. So everything they're, they're using is sort of found within their natural environment. Now, while their production may have been wholly insular, the inspiration for it, their designs, as I mentioned, was not. So from here, I'm gonna to shift to a formal analysis and meaning of the illuminations. Now, the fame of Kells is not only in its rich history or manufacture, but of course, in the lavishness of its designs, which include abstract ornament, delicate knotwork, and flattened Byzantine imagery, which includes plants, playful animals, uh, and human portraits, which glorify the life and death of Jesus Christ. Notable here are the ways in which illuminators of Kells synthesize a variety of resources, which they've copied and adapted to form a distinctive style. Now I'll start here by asking everyone what I ask all of my students, uh, which is which of the different kinds of ornament I've just outlined and that you see here is actually Irish. So I have for you folio two verso, which is an illustrated canon table. A canon table is a concordance device which was invented to indicate which passages are shared across the Gospels. So if you sort of take a moment and observe uh, different kinds of ornaments, and I'll go through them with you now, um, I want you to think about which ones you think might actually uh, be native to Ireland. So we have figurative elements, of course, and across the top you see um, this figure here, this Christ figure here, and an angel below. We also have these composite animal forms, so there's sort of like a griffin and an eagle with um, some kind of bovine animal head here. Uh, we also have knotwork bands, which you'll have noticed around the perimeter of the illustration. And we have um, animal interlace, animal interlace or zoomorphic interlace, which is in these sort of little trapezoidal shapes that we have here. We also have a lot of different kinds of geometric ornament. We have a meandering fret pattern, which is uh, right here in this sort of roundel here. Um, we also have a checkerboard pattern, which you see in the center. And then finally, we have these spirals that you see in these two roundels here to either side. So um, a lot to look at. There's almost what we would describe as this sort of horror vacui or fear of empty space in Irish illuminations in that every available surface has been made fully decorative. So I ask again, which do you think of all of these different decorative programs is Irish? Now, when I was first asked this question, I said not work. And my second guess, uh, being an Irish dancer, was of course the zoomorphic or the animal interlace. Um, and if that was what you thought, I'm afraid we were both wrong. Though Ireland has long been associated with not work and with animal interlace, um, these patterns actually uh, come from Lombardic Italy, where um, knotwork was actually um, in use in that period, and uh, probably dates even later back to late antique Roman mosaics and Coptic Christian, Coptic Christian textiles from Egypt, and has even appeared in some examples in Byzantine art material culture. Now the animal interlace um, actually also comes from somewhere else that is uh, most strongly associated with Anglo-Saxon metalwork, which is a little bit earlier and likely came there from um, earlier Scythian and Germanic influences. So if anyone has recently seen the Netflix film, The Dig, which just came out, you may have seen these examples um, from the Sutton Who Hoard, which dates to about the seventh century. Um, so this is a purse lid and a buckle. 
These were all found at that site and they display panels of interlocking stepped garnets, which is the red color that you see, and checked Milla Fiore insets, which are these little round uh, bits of glass down at the bottom here. And you can see that there are interlaced ornament, um, which we call in our history Germanic style two, um, which is just a fancy name for ribbon animals. And you also see interlocking boars, which are sort of interfacing with this sort of human figure here. So these are all things um, that are not necessarily native to Ireland. Now the geometric ornament that we saw actually um, comes from Byzantine manuscripts, which were um, again drawing from even earlier late Roman antique models. So that leaves us with the spirals. Now the spirals are actually coming out of native ornament which existed in Ireland from the late Iron Age. So it's a style that we call Laten and it actually arrived in Ireland from mainland Europe um, with, um, with the Celts. Um, and we're not precisely sure about when that arrival would have been, but we know that a lot of our earliest examples of this style, La Ten, come uh, from about the first century. Um, and they continue all the way up um, through the medieval period. They're carried into the kinds of work that our Celtic um, monks were producing. Um, and if you're familiar at all with um, the um, Greek sculpture, the Dying Gaul. This is actually a Roman copy. Um, you may have seen some examples. Um, you can see around his neck, he's actually wearing a torque. Um, and you see at the bottom, um, a bronze, what would have been a bronze trumpet. These were examples of uh, Celtic material culture um, that would have had Latin ornament on them. So while most of the ornaments that we've um, come to associate with the Book of Kells um, actually come from somewhere else. Um, it's their particular combination here which makes them Irish. Now the first time we see this combination of interlace, spirals, and zoomorphic ornament is actually in the Book of Duro, which I have an illustration of for you here. Book of Duro is the oldest surviving fully illuminated book in Northwestern Europe. It's about 1300 years old and at least 100 years older than Kells. Now Duro is similar in the text, in the typeface, but its illumination is a little less intricate, well, a lot less intricate as you can see, and uh, fairly less sophisticated in terms of the form and the colors that were used. But what I wanna tease out for you here before moving back to Kells is the way that Duro is really drawing from resources in Irish metalwork. And I just want to point out here the, um, these little round dots. And of course, the, there's the animal interlace that we've come to associate with Kells and with insular manuscript production. But these little dots, these roundels, the stippling that you see here is also uh, being used in the Book of Duro and in the Book of Kells. You see it here in the head of the animal. And that is used just to sort of create um, like a darker value to create value um, and to create visual interest. Um, and so even the, um, the patterning on this lion um, is drawing from uh, that resource there. Now this is actually um, a gospel page. This is meant to be a portrait of St. John. Um, it's a lion, although uh, the lion is not St. John's symbol. Um, but clearly we can see here that our artist has never actually seen a lion and he's sort of conjuring one from imagination. Um, but these two dimensional abstract um, techniques were actually being derived um, from the metalwork. And we can even look at Irish high cross examples here. Now, going back to our canon tables, the framing device recalls the chancel arch of a church, as you can see, um, but it's here given an Irish treatment. And a similar convention exists in other manuscripts from the period, which include uh, Lindisfarne Gospels, the Book of Duro, which I just mentioned, uh, the Cathac and the Echternach Gospels, which constitute a canon of insular manuscript production. Um, to which the Book of Kells belongs. We might also consider how the um, now in the library of St. Gall in Switzerland, uh, a book which is clearly here um, produced by someone who is conversant in this insular style. So you can see that in the example at left, uh, a page from this Gaul um, gospel book, which is actually in Switzerland, is very much in sort of the same style as Kells and has a lot of the same ornament. 
Now, the influence of scriptoriums in the period may have been rivaled by those of the contemporary Carolingian Empire. However, as we see in the canon tables, there is an anti-classical reaction here. Um, and so the example on the right-hand side, uh, which is St. Matthew from the Gospel Book of Charlemagne, is sort of looking back to um, classical antiquity, and it's sort of reaching towards naturalism. Whereas the example on the left, which is um, cont roughly contemporary, and is also a portrait of St. Matthew, it's from the Book of Kells, you can see um, is quite abstract. Um, so what we're assuming here is that this is really a very conscious attempt by um, the monks at Kells to assert a kind of artistic independence. It's kind of like their brand. They're trying to deliberately distinguish themselves from other monasteries um, in, in mainland uh, European production. Now we can consider this sort of abstract style a little bit more closely um, in the portrait of Christ, which you see here um, in folio 32 verso. Christ is here depicted frontally, which is a pose that's largely reserved just for the Christ figure. And he's here um, on either side, you can see um, these peacock figures. Um, the reason you see the peacock in the Book of Kells is that the peacock was um, sort of used as a symbol to represent Christ. And that's because there was this medieval belief that peacock flesh never decayed. And so it's used to sort of denote everlasting life. Now below, uh, Christ is flanked by angels, which are sort of turned in profile, again, because the frontal pose is reserved for Christ in this instance. And um, you can see that these are really abstracted in terms of the way the human figure and the ornament is sort of produced. The attention here is not to suggest a natural space or a believable space, but rather to create a divine space that's utterly unlike anything in the known world. And we get that in spades here with these human figures, uh, which are reduced to these flattened shapes. And they have these very expressive sort of almond shaped eyes, their hair, clothing, feathers, textures are all abstracted in ways that deny any sense of depth in a real pictorial space. The elaborately um, embellished frame is like a keyhole, which contains the entire scene. And I'll add here that our illuminators followed fairly strict compositional devices. Um, and that was intended to uh, create a sense of continuity in the kinds of messages that people were used to seeing. So you didn't, you'd get um, a way of portraying Christ and you would kind of stick to it um, so that people could recognize the different images within these books. But the way that they were styled and the ornament that you were, you were using to accompany these images was where um, a scriptorium might distinguish its copy of a, of a gospel text from another, which is sort of what we're seeing here. Now, um, I should also look at the key row page because that is um, really one of the most important um, pages in the entire book, certainly the most lavish and even the most enigmatic. Um, and again, the key row is a symbol for Christ. Um, and it's sort of um, illustrating um, Christ's name in Greek, and that's the X and the P. Um, and in Kells, it actually, we also see a third letter down the bottom, the iota, which is the next letter in Greek. Um, and when we compare this to other uh, insular manuscripts that similarly embellish the key row initials, Kells puts a distinct emphasis on Christ's name. Um, and it happens to be the first time that Christ's name appears in the text, which is why this page is sort of very lavishly calling attention to that now the Kells miniature here is also making a visual connection between Christ's birth and his death. And they're doing that by employing an X shape, which you can see sort of right here. You see actually um, a lot of X's sort of throughout the book of Kells. Now hidden within these sort of very intricate, uh, what appear to be from this vantage point, geometric um, themes are also um, very whimsical um, images of animals and insects that I'm going to go through with you. So um, at the top, we have a moth and you can see that up in the right hand side. Um, the moth was a symbol of resurrection due to their natural metamorphosis. So that's again, um, a representation of Christ. We also have at the bottom of your screen mice which are nibbling on Eucharist hosts and they're being beset upon by cats which may depict um, 
an actual nuisance of infestation um, in the monastery, or it could also be an allusion to um, the unworthy consuming the host being subject to punishment in the afterlife. There's also, I think, a lovely black otter with a fish in its mouth, and I'll point that out to you here. He's actually upside down. This is his tail here, and his mouth is down here. He has a salmon in his mouth. And that is um, relating to a story of monks who miraculously survived through the benevolence of a rather, a rather helpful otter. And we hear uh, about those references in the life of St. Kevin and in the voyage of St. Brendan. Now, we might also read these animals as representing earth, water, and sky, um, underlying Christ's role as the creator. So I'll move forward here to talk about just a few more animal symbols. Uh, we have, of course, the lion who appears in the text, um, and that relates to the medieval belief that lion cubs are born dead and that following birth, uh, a male lion would come and breathe life into them. Um, and that, of course, relates to, um, to Christ's resurrection. We also have a lot of snakes, and um, snakes have a double meaning, of course, symbolizing evil. Um, but also, um, they're used as symbols of renewal and rebirth because they uh, shed their skin. Now, cats are huge in the Book of Kells, um, and there's a lot uh, that's made of their appearance. They're rather prolific, and they're usually depicted um, doing what they do best or what they did best in the in the time, which is chasing mice. And this is um, possibly again a, a reference to life in the monastery, um, but is also uh, relating to specific passages in the gospel. And another really interesting interpretation of why there are so many cats in the Book of Kells comes from a ninth century lyrical poem about a cat named Pangar Bong. Um, you know, cats were definitely part of monastery life um, and they were there to sort of protect the food from um, infestation. Um, and in the poem, the anonymous poet is sort of comparing Pongar's work to his own in the scriptorium. Um, and I'll just give you a taste of the translation and you can certainly look up um, the poem in Google. It's very easy to find. So uh, the poem goes something like, I and Pongar bon my cat, tis a like task we are at. Hunting mice is his delight. Hunting words I sit all night. Better far than praise of men, tis to sit with book and pen. Now, I won't read you the whole poem, um, but the point that's being made here uh, through our poet and his cat is that they're both trying to solve a very difficult problem. Our, our poet is um, an illuminator trying to work through a difficult image and the cat is, um, is trying to catch mice. So he concludes, practice every day has made hunger perfect in his trade. I get wisdom day and night, turning darkness into light. And if you've been to see Kells, you maybe have recognized that phrase which appears in the exhibition. So I'm gonna finish up here uh, by sort of thinking about the legacy of Kells and sort of how it has informed a collective sense of Irishness, uh, particularly across the diaspora. So if you visited Kells, you've uh, likely seen some of the very kitschy souvenirs that have been sold, coffee mugs and scarves and keychains, um, jewelry. Um, but you may have seen some really wonderful references to Kells, like the 2009 film, um, The Secret of Kells, uh, which if you have not seen it, I urge you to do that. And you do not need to have little children with you to enjoy that film, I promise. Um, it's actually a wonderful um, illuminated or animated film that really nicely draws from some historical references. Um, and having discussed it with you in detail tonight, I think you'll appreciate it that much more. But I have one sort of final kitschy bit um, that I'll end on, and that is this contemporary Irish dancing dress, um, which is very explicitly referencing the Book of Kells. And you see on the left-hand side, um, images that come directly from Kells. They're um, images of the four evangelists. And then on the back, um, this sort of very literal representation of Kells as a physical book with a binding, with a title printed on the side, which is of course um, what we all know now to be completely silly and anachronistic. Um, but what I'd like to close with is to say, um, you know, that Irish identity, identity is particularly, you know, since the turn of the century, very closely connected to the sense of nationalism, um, and particularly Irish Catholicism, very connected to this book of the um, Book of Kells. 
um, even as Ireland has changed and become more secular in recent years. Um, but I hope what I've illustrated for you here today is that Kells is more than the sum of its parts. It's a work that exemplifies Ireland's standing as a revered and insular outpost at the edge of the medieval world, whose prodigious output is still beloved even today. And that's it. Thank you very much.